Matthew 13, 24 to 43. He presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while people were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and left. When the plants sprouted and produced grain, then the weeds also appeared. The landowner's slaves came to him and said, Master, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Then where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he told them. So do you want us to go and gather them up? The slaves asked him. No, he said. When you gather up the weeds, you might also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and tie them in bundles to burn them, but store the wheat in my barn. He presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when grown... It's taller than the vegetables and becomes a tree so that the birds of the sky come and nest in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into 50 pounds of flour until it spread through all of it. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables and he would not speak anything to them without a parable so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. I'll open my mouth in parables. I'll declare things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Then he dismissed the crowds and went into the house. His disciples approached him and said, Explain the parable of the weeds in the field to us. He replied, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are angels. Therefore, just as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they'll gather from his kingdom everything that causes sin and those guilty of lawlessness. They'll throw them into the blazing furnace where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in their father's kingdom. Anyone who has ears should listen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dissonance and disappointment. As I said earlier on today at the 8.30 service, that's a lot of syllables to start a sermon with, isn't it? Dissonance and disappointment. Well, I reckon that's exactly what Jesus' disciples are experiencing at this point. I actually suspect that's what Jesus' disciples experience many days of the week in many parts of the world. Dissonance, or to be more precise, cognitive dissonance, is when what we are told or know doesn't match what we experience. So I've been told this, I know this truth, that's not what today is looking like. That's not what these things are like in front of me. What we know clashes with what we experience. Now, in many situations, the best case scenario out of that is at least disappointment. The worst case scenario is destruction. Just pause and consider the disciples at this point in Matthew's biography of Jesus. Remember the whole thrust of the biography of Jesus has been to show that he's come to bring the outsiders in, to restore them, to make them whole, to deal with their sins. He's the pointy end of God's promise to restore the universe. Well, at this point, the disciples are standing there and probably scratching their heads. They're probably feeling a level of apprehension, if not conflict and doubt in their hearts. The man they've committed to, Jesus, the man who says he's come to restore the universe to God's design, well, that man has a death sentence hanging over his head from the religious authorities. And here he is teaching this huge number of people, the crowds that follow him everywhere, with the most obscure method of teaching you can find, parables. What's going on? Where are the heights of the Sermon on the Mount where we'll inherit the kingdom of heaven? What's Jesus doing wasting such a huge opportunity in front of him? Why is it that those who go to Bible college are rejecting him? Where's the growth in the kingdom that Jesus said he was going to bring in? What could possibly happen? when you put 12 men together with a carpenter and some hangers-on. Let me pray, and we're going to find out. Dear Lord, thanks for your word. 
I thank you for Jesus who speaks your word, who is your word in such clarity. Father, today, I, I don't know that I don't know the weeks we've come to to be gathered as your people, but today we pray that you'll speak to us in a way that dispels our disappointment and dissonance and helps us be your disciples till the end of the age. In Jesus' name, amen. Dissonance and disappointment. I think that's what Jesus' disciples are experiencing at this point in Matthew's Gospel. Uh, There were some head nods earlier on when I said that they often experience it even today. Such great news. Why do people oppose it so much, especially those who should know better? Such great news. Why is it being taught with such an obscure teaching method? Well, the disciples will end up going out into the world to teach that truth, won't they? If you skip to the end of the gospel, and I'm not spoiling any endings here, Jesus commissions them to go out into the world to make more disciples. So I think it's understandable that at this point, he speaks to them in such a way that he dispels their disappointment by dealing with their dissonance. He dispels their disappointment by dealing with their dissonance. I'm at point two on the outline, as Phil pointed out last week, this is a slight change in Matthew's biography. Uh, We've got a huge number of parables here, these short, pithy stories. They've been a theme so far. And Jesus is using them as part of his teaching method and Matthew confirms that that's right. Look there in verse 34. Jesus told the crowds all these things in parables and he would not speak anything to them without a parable so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. I'll open my mouth in parables. I'll declare things kept secret from the foundation of the world. Now you've got to pick up this is Matthew's interpretation, isn't it? This isn't Jesus, as we heard last week. This is Matthew going, yeah, Jesus is right. It's to be expected that he teaches this way. In fact, when you look at where Matthew quotes from Psalm 78, which Margaret read the first part for us today, you'll realise that this is how it's always gone with God and his people. This is how it's always gone with God and his people. Read Psalm 78 today. Uh, It is a striking poem. It's a very simple poem because it shows the history of God's dealing with his people. And Matthew says that what the disciples are seeing now is part of the historical relationship between God and his people. This this is the way it works. I'm going to make a promise to give you a land that you don't own. Yeah, we can do better without you, God. I'm going to save you by plagues from slavery in Egypt. No, we can do better without you, God. I'm going to take you into the promised land against people who look like giants who've lived there for decades. Hey, God, we can do better without you. Do you get the pattern? God does a miraculous thing in full public view and God's people say, we can do better without you. We reject you. God acts very clearly in divine intervention and God's people say, we can do better without you. And it's the pattern right throughout Psalm 78. Continually, God does this, his people respond with hard hearts. God does this, his people reject him. God does this, his people are adulterous. It finally ends Psalm 78 with God going, it's okay. From little things, big things grow. I'm going to take one bloke from the family of David. I don't want to get my people out of that. I'm going to get my people out of that. Uh, It happens that way, the psalm tells us, so that we realise that the letters after our name or before our name or our family heritage or our skin colour have nothing to do with God saving us. God alone saves. And that's exactly what the disciples are seeing at this point, are they? There is the Son of God standing in front of all the people of God doing something in full public view, healing on the Sabbath, raising people from the dead, doing all sorts of miraculous things, and they go, we'd rather kill him. We reject him. And the parables are Jesus' teaching tool to confirm that division in front of him, to confirm the hardness of the hearts of the people of God like they've always been. And Jesus reminds the insiders 
that they only have knowledge because God has brought it to them. God has brought it to them. And so he continues to teach the crowd in parables. I do suspect the disciples were disappointed. I mean, of all the teaching methods you could use in that day and age, parables were fairly obscure. We forget that fact. They're not a wide-used teaching tool, and Jesus uses that to confirm the division in front of him. And in this section, he teaches three more parables. I'm at point three on the outline. Uh, they're different to the first parable. They all focus on the same thing. Did you pick that up? I look there in verse 24. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to... Look down there in verse 31, the kingdom of heaven is like. Down there in verse 32, 33, the kingdom of heaven is like. We've heard that phrase, haven't we, the kingdom of heaven? You just go back to verse 11 and it's there with the disciples they've been given the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. It's there when Jesus describes his family in chapter 12, 50, those who do the will of my Father in heaven. It's there when Jesus deals with those who say he's really just doing it by the power of the devil. In chapter 12, 28, it's breaking in the kingdom of heaven. It's the key image in the Sermon of the Mount as Jesus says to his disciples, you'll have the kingdom of heaven. And so we know Jesus is connected with this kingdom. He is the kingdom at this point. And that the kingdom involves humans restored to what God designed them to be. That to get into the kingdom, you just need to be connected to Jesus. But once you're in the kingdom, you reflect your big brother by obeying the Father. These parables are told to confirm the hardness in front of him and to reveal the secrets to those beside him. And so I think it's worth pausing at this point to go, well, how did the crowds hear this? Have you ever thought that? We're so much on the inside that we don't stop to think about how the outsiders hear the parables. How might they have listened to what Jesus was saying? Well, the first parable, the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer sowing good seed. The enemy comes in and sows lookalike wheat weeds and they all grow together until the farmer sorts them out on harvest day. The second parable, well, it's like going to Woolies. You get a small seed and you get a big plant. But this is ginormous a huge tree to which all the birds of the world come to nest. Third parable, it's like yeast that you knead into a dough of a big pile of dough big enough to feed a hundred people. Three parables, the kingdom of heaven is like, how might the crowd have heard them? Have you thought about that? Now I know this is guesswork. I'm being very transparent here. I know this is guesswork, but it's worth thinking about how the outsiders heard them. How might they have heard that first parable? I've had a bit of a guess. Perhaps they thought something like this, that Jesus is so naive. To expect your enemy wouldn't undermine you? What a naive fellow. Could be something like this. He's a bit black and white, this Jesus, isn't he? People in and people out. I mean, they all look the same, don't they? They're all people. It's all the same way. I mean, really burning them up in the fire, it's a bit extreme, isn't it? Perhaps he thought something, they thought something like this. I mean, what a foolish fellow that Jesus is. Surely if you're the ruler of the world, you know the way the world works. What about the second parable? How might they have heard that one? I mean, really, really, if you just sit down and chat with a decent PR expert, starting with something so small, I mean, you want some publicity, don't you, if you're going to make a splash? If you're going to make a kingdom, I mean, a mustard seed? A carpenter and a ragtag bunch of fishermen, radicals and ex-tax collectors? Why start with that? Or maybe the third parable, how might they have heard that? Something invisible changing the world? Yeast? I mean, good Jews get rid of yeast out of their households, don't they? Especially at this time of the year. Why would you start with something invisible? I mean, and... Something invisible affecting a loaf that big? It's worth actually pausing at points to think about that, isn't it? Because we forget that the parables were spoken to the outsiders. Jesus is very clear. He's already called them outsiders. They're not in his family. He's already said that earlier. We need to think through how the crowd hears them to get the full weight of what is going on as the disciples listen to them. But he does explain it to the disciples. I'm at point four on the outline. Look there at verse 36. 
Then he dismissed the crowds and went into the house. His disciples approached him and said, explain the parable of the weeds in the field to us. Now we miss how desperate those words are. They actually command Jesus, you must explain this to us. You must. And notice that they don't ask about the other two parables. I think that's important, that absence. Because I think it suggests that if you get this first parable straight, the other two fall into line. The key to understanding the other two is the first one. And his explanation goes through the various parts of the first parable. Look there in verse 37. He replied, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, the good seeds, they're the sons of the kingdom, the weeds are the sons of the evil one, the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, the harvesters are angels. Therefore, just as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Let me just make a couple of comments before we unpack it. Don't get distracted by the things Jesus doesn't explain. We can too often get distracted. Jesus tells us what we need, doesn't he? Don't worry about what the nighttime looks like and why they fell asleep. We're not told. Just deal with what he tells us. And what he tells us is very interesting. Did you notice that the sower remains the same? The sower remains Jesus. Do you notice the change in the seed, though? In the parable we heard last week, the seed was the word of God. Now it's the people of God. The paddock, well, it's the whole world. The enemy, well, he hasn't changed his tactics, has he? If you knew your enemy from chapter 3 of Genesis, you know he'll never launch a front-on attack, will he? He's just a slippery, sneaky serpent. So he comes at night and he comes by stealth. And let me tell you, could you think of a more non-aggressive image than a seed? A seeds just sit in the soil and do their thing, don't they? They don't march in with weapons and loud voices. They don't plant their flag down and say, this is mine. They just get planted and grow. That's something we're thinking about, isn't it? Well, when Jesus explains the parable, it's one of movement, isn't it? It's direction. He explains the world in front of the disciples then and now as one of mixture. God's people are spread how far? Everywhere in the paddock. And you know what? They're cheek by jowl with the enemies. They're spread right throughout the paddock too. Both are humans. Both live in the world. That's what creates the dissonance, isn't it? That the world looks broken. The world is broken. Our bones creak, our hearts ache, we cry, we mourn. And that's the world we live in, cheek by jowl, with the people of the enemy. But the dissonance is answered by the movement. It's still a farmer's field, isn't it? He's got a harvest plant. He knows when it's going to happen. The seed remains in the field growing daily. The reapers have been booked in and the harvest day has been organised. There's the current state of the world that the disciples are experiencing, but it's going somewhere, isn't it? It's going to a day, to a harvest day, to an end point. There is movement. And in the movement, there is hope. Because there will be a day when the kingdom of God exists and is consummated in all of its magnificence, where our bones will not... Did you catch that in Revelation 21? Our bones won't ache, our tears won't fall, and death will not walk the world. Restoration is promised in all its goodness on that day. And there is hope here too, because evil thinks it rules. The devil thinks he's pulled the wool over God's eyes. And those who oppose the people of God cheer. But there will be a day when that will all be wiped away, when all that evil will be removed and where God's people will be so whole and magnificent that they will shine like stars around the sun. 
there is movement. That's the answer to the cognitive dissonance, isn't it? There is movement. You experience the damage and broken state of the world in a movement to restoration. But as he deals with that dissonance, he also deals with the disappointment. That first parable lays down the foundation for understanding the other two, which talk about the nature of the growth of the kingdom. On the one hand, the kingdom does start small, doesn't it? I mean, when you really think about it, a carpenter and 12 plus some hangers-on. But when you put it in the big picture, which is why Psalm 78 is so important, you'll realise that that's how God has always worked. Populate the whole world, I'll start with two. Deal with a flood, I'll start with one. Roll back sin, I'll get one idol worshipper. Rescue my people from slavery, I'll take a bloke who's kicking sheep around. Have a ruler for my people, I'll take the youngest of the shepherds. Bring my people back, I'll put a prophet here one at a time. Deal with sin for all humanity. I'll send my one son. God always starts small and he finishes magnificent. Finishes magnificent. So that we know that God alone saves. On the other hand, that influence of that smallness is pervasive, it's ubiquitous, it's perpetual, often hidden and unseen. Like yeast, it's energised and managed and massaged out. And it will work through the whole pile of dough wherever the children of the kingdom are planted. Wherever they are, the influence of the kingdom is. In those three parables, Jesus just confirms the crowd's hardness and the religious leaders. And he also places the secrets with the twelve. Puts it in the whole context of the history of the people of God, how he's always dealt with hard-hearted humanity. Confirms the secret of the kingdom for his people. It's moving. It's moving. It's growing. It's influencing. When the restoration happens, you will see its grandness and he dispels their dissonance and disappointment in the here and now. A clear explanation of the state of the world, a clear nature of the kingdom of God, a clear movement of all things against the backdrop of all history. So what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do with it? Well, I'm at the last point on the outline, and what we're going to do with it are those words. First, we must recognise the beauty of, of our divine father. You see, the one ruling and running this world is not the devil. It's God. It's our father in heaven. He has sent the sower. He has organised the seed. He's organised the planting. He's organised the harvest. He's organised even the places where the seed falls. He's organised the movement in size, purpose and influence. Is that not reassuring? Encouraging? It's still the farmer's land and the harvest will come. It leaves his disciples with a very clear job. So, because I'm with you and I have all the authority, which leads to the second point, being dedicated and not distracted. Have you noticed how dedicated Jesus is? How single-minded this man is? He is never distracted, is he? Sowing, sowing, sowing. Sowing, sowing, sowing. Sowing, sowing, sowing. That's the focus of the kingdom, sowing. That's why... The kingdom is sown in such a way so that the people of the kingdom can get on with the sowing. Don't get distracted, Jesus is saying to his disciples. Don't get distracted by good things. Don't get distracted by the goodness of work and rest and family. 
Don't get distracted by distracting things, giving them more importance than God thinks they deserve, like well, the state of politics at the moment and the legislation that was passed in this parliament. Don't get distracted. We have a job as disciples. What is it? So, 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 and just keep on some. And as you do, thirdly, be discerning and not devaluing. And by that I mean hold the same discernment and distinctions that Jesus holds. Don't devalue the reality. There are insiders and there are outsiders. There are disciples and there are not disciples. There is the kingdom of heaven and there are those not in the kingdom of heaven. Don't devalue that reality. It's urgency, it's seriousness. And don't devalue the significance of the influence of the people of God where they are planted. God put his people there so the influence could be everywhere. It comes through sowing, the visible and verbal proclamation of Jesus in front of people, but it also comes in all manner of life, in art and culture and sport, in speaking, in practice, proclamation, relationship. Disciples must not devalue who they are, where they are, or why they are there. And finally, there is much to delight in here, isn't there? Just think about it. Much to delight in. There's a clear explanation of the state of the world, isn't there? And a better exposure of the devil than any human will have. There's a clear reassurance that the farmer is still in charge and the paddock is getting ready for a harvest day. There's the wonder of the prospect that on that harvest day, our bones won't ache and I'll never cry again. There is an urgency and delight that there is a field still to be sown and the disciples are there to do it, to sow and to sow and to sow. And there is a motivation here to have a right understanding of who we are. We're exactly where God planned us to be, to sow, to be his kingdom to spread its influence. There's nothing dissonant or disappointing about that, is there? Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that your boy sows and that we are the result. Father, please help us to sow, not to be distracted. Please help us not to devalue the urgency of the task at hand. Please help us to delight in the divine hand of you, our Father, organising not only the planting and the growth, but also the harvest. And please help us to delight in that day when the sons of glory will stand in your presence as a people made of men and women from every nation and every country and every age. They'll stand in your presence to shine like the stars forever. And we look forward to that day. Amen.